Welcome to Breaking Doctrine, presented to you by the Combined Arms Doctrine Directorate at the Combined Arms Center at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. The views expressed here are those of the individual and do not represent the views of the Combined Arms Center, U.S. Army, or U.S. Government. Welcome to Breaking Doctrine, a U.S. Army Combined Arms Center podcast on emerging doctrine and the Army's vision of warfare. I'm Captain Wyatt Harper, and this podcast topic is turning lessons learned into doctrine. With me today is Colonel Chris Keller, the Director of the Center for Army Lessons Learned, or CALL, and Mr. Rich Tottleman, the Deputy Director of CALL, and Mr. Chuck Schrankel, the Chief of the Command and Control Division at the Combined Arms Doctrine Directorate, or CAD. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thank you. Hello, Wyatt. <laughs> so today we're, we're discussing the relationship between Army doctrine and Army lessons learned and how the lessons that we learn influence our doctrine. Uh, the lead organization for that, for the Army Lessons Learned program, is CALL. Um, CALL is well known throughout the force for embedding personnel with operations, collecting insights and observations, conducting studies on Army and joint operations, and, and producing pocket-sized handbooks that cover a variety of topics. However, best practices, lessons learned, are not actual doctrine. And today we're going to talk about that. So um, how the force generates feedback, calls role in that process, and then how the observations made during an operation influence Army doctrine. So normally, sir, we usually start with doctrine as the preamble to the topic, but today I think it's a good idea to start with the lessons learned program, and then we'll circle back to how that feeds into doctrine. So, Colonel Keller, sir, can you give us some background on your organization and its mission and its purpose? Sure, Wyatt, and thanks thanks again for this great opportunity. Thanks to the whole CAD team. Uh, Chuck, great to have you here with us, and Rich, thanks for being my wingman. I was always up here. You know, I, I did want to start, before I go into the lesson learning program, I did want to just hit on, the, I think it's real important to highlight that there is a there is a good relationship between um, the doctrine division at CAD, you know, between CAD and CALL. There always has been. And, and that's super critical for us to all remember in terms of how we're we're evolving and growing as an army. This relationship that so as we as as we like to sometimes call ourselves the scouts on the ground, you know, looking and seeing what's emerging, what's changing, what's trending in the army, we can feed that into the doctrine division. So we really do appreciate this opportunity to be with you today. Uh, so the the lessons learned um, program uh, is is something that we have uh, as as a lead as a as a focus for our organization and we're the uh, the lead agency that has oversight for that lessons learned program the alp um and we we uh our mission is to collect analyze disseminate identify and nominate issues and archive lessons and or best practices across all levels of war to facilitate rapid adaption and enable operationally based decision making so that's our mission statement um, that does a lot of things for it. It opens a lot of doors for us. We'll, we'll talk about that later on as we get into it. Uh, we're, we're also, as the, um, as the Office of Primary Responsibility for the Army, we're again the lead agency for the Army Lessons Learned Program, uh, we, we play a, a key role in the oversight. And there's a lot of ways we do that you know, in terms of just day-to-day in our action with organizations, uh, with different agencies. But there's a bit of a, a process, like everything, uh, but certainly within TRADOC and our organization, there's a lot of processes that we participate in, and the, and the Lessons Learned program is really a yearly uh, program that we, we developed so that we are focused on the right uh, topics in terms of what we're looking at for lessons uh, for the Army. So that's one thing we, we participate in. We also run the uh, Army Lessons Learned Forum which is a really critical, again, process for us. That's a quarterly event that's uh, chaired by the CAT commander. Uh, we'll t- I think we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but that's really a, a, our, our action arm, if you will, on how we're really bringing some of these lessons or, or uh, uh, observations that we've identified. We're bringing that to a more senior level, and we're able to get that into the three-star GOSC and then typically very well uh, participated in by uh, members of the operational force across the Army. So that's a real key uh, aspect of another process that we help to run for the Army. Uh, we'll talk about JILIS, the, uh, the, the repository that we, we uh, host, run for the Army. It, it is a joint system, but we, we, uh, we host it for the Army in terms of making sure these lessons are, are put into a repository so they're available. One, to anybody out in the, in the joint uh, world, but they're also available to certainly Army units. 
so that, uh, again, we can put those lessons into a, a database that we can reference later on, but um, also, probably more importantly, that units can go into that repository and, and learn from other units so they don't do, have the same uh, experience. Uh, and then I think the last, um, the last point I think I'll make there in terms of kind of what we do for the Lessons Learned program is, um, you know, we, we develop teams to go out and, and focus on different collection events or lessons learned events, and that's tied to the lesson learned program, you know, identifying those, those, uh, those key bits we want to get after. Uh, we, and, and those teams a lot of times will come back and develop products. You've probably seen I mean, some of our products that are available online or in hard copy, so we, we develop a lot of those products as well so that um, soldiers uh, can benefit from those, those written products. And then the other uh, key point that I think we bring to the, uh, the fight is that we'll go out and we'll train units in lessons learned uh, process. Uh, we'll, we'll do that for U.S. Army units, but we also have done a lot of that for joint partners as well across the world, you know, going out and helping uh, different uh, countries develop a, uh, a similar lessons learned capability. So that's, that's kind of, I think, starting off, that's just an overview of what we do and you know, a little bit of how we do it and some of our process. Uh, and how we try to move the ball forward on lessons learned. Sure, sir. So it sounds like you guys are, you guys are involved in everything from the learning in the learning process, right? So uh, I'd like you to bring you and uh, Mr. Tottle Ben. Sure. Um, you want to run us through the end-to-end -end process. Uh, I'm curious as to the and this for you too, uh, Colonel Keller. Um, how does how does a lesson you know once we learn it, how does it make its way? through through the four-step process I, I understand there's discovery validation integration and assessment but it's more than just gathering the standard after action review comments or whatever can you kind of go through that process yeah, sure um, we uh, we have an army lessons learned course that we run at call uh, and it's in the ATAR system and we also teach an elective over at the Command and General Staff College for CGSE students that will, will go into those four phases of, of a lessons learned program. Uh, and those four phases are aligned with the joint lessons learned program as well. So it kind of flows that we're kind of doing the same things that our, that our, our battle buddies in the Marine Corps or the Air Force or the Navy are doing. Um, and the first step of, of that phase is discovery. Uh, where, where we determine that, that there is a gap or there is an issue or there is a lesson out there that may be shared with the greater army or the joint force that will improve uh, operations or the, the way we do business in, in, in the military uh, for others. Um, and we discover those issues and lessons uh, by sending out those teams that Colonel Keller talked about, the collection and analysis teams. Um, or, uh, and, and those teams are going out to major exercises like Defender, uh, the Defender series of exercises. We sent a team up to Alaska uh, in February uh, to look at some Arctic gaps um, we, uh, we sent, uh, we, didn't, we didn't send, but we formed a team to look at the Army's response to COVID-19. Uh, and, and so those teams are out there being those scouts, making observations to identify uh, and discover those issues, lessons, and best practices out there. So that's one way we do it. The second way we do it is a lot of times they're, they're, it, it comes down from leaders. Leaders in units, um, we get emails from brigade and division commanders, hey, I have a problem with maintaining a common operational picture. How often does something like that happen? Um, we get those rather frequently. I, I would say at least two or three times a month. Sometimes they come, a lot of times they'll come through our Army Lessons Learned Forum, GOSC, where they, they are given to us. You know, we're out there scouting and we're looking at it, but oftentimes high priority, high visibility issues come to us uh, directly through our leadership chain in TRADOC and also from ForceCon. And just jumping in there, Rich, that's spot on. I think the, the other answer I would offer there is it, it just depends, right? Like, like anything in the Army, it just depends how frequently we, we get those. And, and I think it just it ebbs and flows 
based off the operational tempo of the army you know what's going on right now what's changed you know a lot of times we, we can call talk about you know we'll get our system set you know we'll get focused on how we think we're going to do the year kind of like i alluded to earlier the, with the plan um, but you know the world gets a vote the operational environment gets a vote so sometimes i think there are years where we get a lot of the um, top driven if you will topics there are other times where we are are able to to stay a little bit more on plan and, and do more of a deliberate process on what we, we've identified as issues. But that's that's the beauty, I think, and, and uh, the the power in some ways of call is that over years, I think call has demonstrated that they can be pretty responsive to, to those changes as they come down from the senior leaders. So, yes, sir. I just wanted to talk a little bit more about kind of how we get this stuff into doctrine. And, and I want to make sure everybody understands that, that, that it's not necessarily a formal process, right? I don't necessarily wait for something to come out of the lessons learned form, you know, approved by a GU to tell me to make changes. Uh, you, we get feedback from call in all kinds of ways. Uh, sometimes, again, it's in the form of collection analysis report that has identified a gap. Airspace control, large-scale combat operations. You know, the CAC commander says do X and we start writing, okay? I mean, it's that, that's, that's a good enough lesson learned uh, for us and we're going to be all, uh, all over it. Uh, other times we get feedback from the field during staffings, right? And I think I kind of talked about this earlier where I staff, I think I've done a good job writing a manual and uh, uh, I will staff that out and then I will get feedback from, you know, guys actually have to do this for a living that tell me I'm all screwed up and here's a lesson that you need to uh, kind of, this is, this is what you need to write about. Is, you know, when I start to develop a publication, you know, part of my research is to reach out the call. Uh, to get these, I call them observations, insights, and lessons learned. And I'll have to figure out how to get them on Jillis now. I normally just email Owen, right? Because he's my buddy over there. Say, hey, Owen, I need, uh, can you hook me up with whoever knows about, you know, the latest command and control trends or JAG trends? Uh, and I will get a data dump of information that I can use uh, to kind of help inform uh, the revision of this manual. Uh, oftentimes, uh, uh, as in the case of the command post ATP, again, it was a call CAD couple of guys that went to the National Training Center for, you know, kind of a right seat ride. To, we had not written a command post manual in so long uh, that we kind of had to get smarter on it again. So we had lessons learned uh, uh, from your database, uh, sent Mike Flynn and one of the call guys out to Fort Irwin for a couple of weeks to take notes, you know, kind of on how a brigade command post ran and then went to a division uh, warfighter and a corps. Yeah, so so it's you know it the lessons learned get into doctrine from in a variety of ways. The Army lessons learned form uh, kind of being one, but we're always on the lookout for those. Uh, you know, and and I think the network that Call has established over the years is amazing. And, and I know we've talked about very focused stuff here, you know, but you get constant feedback from the uh, combat training centers. Uh, some excellent products come out of there. Uh, I don't know if you still have uh, embeds, you, you know, with deployed units or things like that, uh, but you used to have, you know, lessons learned folks with every deployed unit downrange, uh, you know, out at Forward and a couple other places, or Irwin and a couple of other places. Uh, and, and so kind of having that constant stream of feedback uh, uh, also helps, I think. Yeah, no, that's a great point. We we don't have quite as robust of a um, LNO or as we formally refer to them as now, uh, military analyst forward. Uh, but we but we do have uh, we still do have them out with units so we don't um, we don't have them with every unit that's deployed uh, but I'll kind of walk through that real quickly since it is certainly part of the discovery phase I think of that we're talking about um, you know we, we have on the ground at all the CTCs we have a permanent presence so we have a at least one or two call representatives at every uh, CTC so NTC JRTC and then over in Germany and Homefels at that JMRC. Uh, we also have a close relationship here with MCTP and, and participate in every warfighter. Um, th those are pretty constant. We have uh, um, that another level that we've been focused on recently and over the past few years is at the ASCC. So user pack, U.S. Army Europe, Africa, um, where else we have them down the CTAF. We have Army South and Army North. Um, as well as not an ASCC, but we've uh, sent a, a, an LNO down to Army Futures Command as well. Uh, so those just kind of run through my mind of the ones that we, we have on the ground right now, really critical to exactly what you said, Chuck, having, having a little bit um, closer eye 
uh, scout a little bit further forward uh, so we can get that information and bring it back. We would love to have representation at every division, core uh, around the, the world, and, and we do have some positions for those. Uh, and we'll continue to try to fill those as best we can. You know, obviously, as organizations grow and and budgets grow or not over the you know the coming years. The, the other key point that's really important, Chuck, you brought up, reminded me of there is even if we don't have a a physical call representative at the core or at the division or at the brigade, uh, you know, one of our guiding documents we might talk about uh, later. You know, Army Regulation 1133 talks about you know, and, and some other guiding documents talk about. Uh, the importance of units identifying a lessons learned representative. So that's again a part of that network. So whether we have our person there or just you know, assistant S3 or sergeant major that, that happens to be the, the designated representative to gather lessons and help us with discovery, that's a key part of our. Of our right, network. and I think technically there's a requirement to publish, to file an after action report with you guys there, there uh, at the conclusion of operations. There is, and I, you got me talking, Chuck, so that's good. But you know, the, I'm sorry. That's good. No, <laughs> sorry. That's, uh, part I was going to hit on that, too. The After Action Review, or AAR, that uh, one of you mentioned a couple of times already, that's been a, an interesting um, education for me in, in my tenure here. So right now the Army has two different interpretations of the acronym AAR, at least two. There's probably more than that, but two that I'm aware of. One's an After Action Review that we all get to enjoy when we're going through a training exercise or NTC, you know, JR, JRTC, the COG, or somebody facilitates an, an after action review. What you just hit on is critical. We, we, we there, there is guidance, you know, there is, uh, uh, well, there is um, direction from, you know, some of our uh, doctrinal uh, publications. It's written in 6.0, FM 6.0. Yeah, 6.0 and 1133, thanks, that, that units, once they conduct an exercise or a, a rotation or a combat deployment and after action report report being the second you know term that is associated with AAR is something that's super beneficial to call that's not necessarily something we get routinely we, we certainly work with units uh, but you know as we continue that network and, and continue that outreach I, I, I would agree with you that's a real important part of our of our feedback process and certainly what we started talking about a few minutes ago, the discovery of lessons learned, we can get that a lot of times through after action reports. Yeah, sure, those, those reports provide the context behind the identification or the discovery of issues, lessons, or best practices. When a lot of times when we say, hey, we, we'd like to see your AAR, they send us a PowerPoint presentation that facilitated a discussion. And the only way that you can get context from that is if you were sitting in the actual hot wash after the training exercise. Um, but uh, going back to discovery and, and, and what Colonel Keller talked about, our collection and analysis teams, here's a perfect opportunity where we link with subject matter experts, not just here at Fort Leavenworth, but also at each one of the centers of excellence. You know, Call has about 102 military and Army civilian professionals authorized, uh, about 75% of them are here at Fort Leavenworth and, and the other ones are out there uh, forward uh, as analysts forward at the CTCs and the Army Service Component Commands. But with, with the 75 or four, so, so folks that we have here at Fort Leavenworth, we, we don't have the corner on the market of subject matter expertise by no means. And, and, and most of our folks are Army civilian professionals and not, and not military with the recent experience. So we reach out to the centers of excellence and, and say, hey, we're, we're going up to the, you know, do, do an Arctic Gap quick look. And we really, really need some uh, subject matter expertise from uh, the Maneuver Support Center on engineering operations um, in, in a, in a uh, extreme cold weather environments or, you know, re reaching out to the, the Sustainment Center of Excellence for logistics considerations, you know, and, 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 and all those things that, that, that are really tough in an in a extreme cold weather environment. And a lot of times when we ask the Centers of Excellence for those folks, they send us their doctrine proponent writers. So not only are we discovering, but we're also reestablishing that link between lessons and best practices and issues 
with the writing of emerging doctrines. So that, there's a great link right there uh, when we reach out for subject matters. And, and the, the next phase of this process is the validation. And again, when it comes time to say, hey, is this a valid issue? Uh, or is it just one off because of personalities or the cert the unique conditions associated uh, you know with with that event? We again go back to the proponent because only the proponent who's responsible for all the dot mill PF capabilities associated with that warfighting function can say yes. We've seen that in other places. We've heard it. Um, we, we, we've uh, we, we've been wrestling with that issue. Uh, so we, we're going to validate that as a, uh, as a standing issue uh, or observation that needs some type of resolution. Um, so that's the second phase, the validation. And again, we work with the, the, the proponents, whether they be TRADOC, medical community, um, in, uh, in trying to develop, the, going to the next step, which is integration, where we start developing the solution sets. Chuck. Yeah, I was going to say, you, you talk stuff that gets validated, and not everything gets validated. Correct. Uh, and and you mentioned the doctor interaction piece. We do get an awful lot of observations from call. Uh, we also get feedback on staffing and manuals, right? Mm -hmm. you, you know, so somebody will make a comment on something that we've written uh, with with a lesson learned. Okay, this is a lesson learned or a best practice. Uh, and and, and <clears throat> we really have to apply some judgment there on, you know, people wonder what happens to those. We really have to apply some judgment because for the most part, what we write uh, here at CAD has to apply across the Army in every OE and theater that's out there. Uh, and very often we'll get very specific comments that may work for, you know, the 1st the 505th in Ambar Province in 2012 but it's not necessarily going to be applicable across the rest of the Army. And that piece of information is good information, and you guys should capture it, but it may be best uh, codified in a local SOP or some type of local command publication. And it just won't make, you know, won't make the big cut. Uh, conversely, you mentioned this Arctic study. You know, I know uh, Ted, uh, who's sitting in the room with me, has been charged with, with kind of recreating the Arctic operations manual uh, here. So I know he's going to be very fascinated in everything you have to offer, uh, you know, that comes out of that, that Arctic study. Yeah, uh, and and we'll pay attention to that, uh, and and often that will serve as a foundation. You know, just based on the fact the requirement is there to have, you know, th the army needs that again. Uh, so then you're going to be the guys out there doing the first coach. Yeah, a lot of our analysts here at Fort Leavenworth are working hand in hand with the Combined Arms Doctrine Directorate or e even uh, uh, act. Army Capability Manager, Echelons of a Brigade, or, or, or the other organizations here that are responsible for producing doctrine. Even, even within the Combined Arms Center training, the Training Management Division, uh, rewriting FM 7.0 on how we train, our analysts that have gone out there, looked at home station training, uh, and, uh, and seen some of those things, are providing input to those those uh, the evolution of those doctrinal resources. Um, the f the final phase is assessment, and that's really where we get to: is it a lessons learned? If, if you talk to some of our friends uh, in uh, in the British Army, they'll they'll talk about lessons observed. Uh, and up to the up to this point, the first three phases, it's an observation. It may have been validated and developed a solution set. But until the solution is applied and changes behavior, at that point, it becomes a lesson learned. Um, and that's a critical point. Call exists to drive change in the Army, change in behavior, not just changing you know, the, the, the combat uniform camouflage pattern or anything like that, to really drive positive change to improve readiness and inform modernization. And so in this assessment phase, we go out and we look or we get after action reports or we talk to the proponents, say, hey, has the solution, and it could be a doctrine, organizational, material, leader development, policy, uh, has that solution fixed the problem or the issue or the gap that we observed and discovered a couple months ago? And that's the critical thing. Just like in an 
after action review, you're doing an assessment, uh, what happened, why it happened, how are we going to fix it, uh, and who's responsible for fixing it. We do that in our assessment phase uh, through our Army Lessons Learned Forum, GOSC, of here's the solution to this gap and which proponent is responsible for moving it into development, whether it's a doctrinal change, whether it's an organizational change. You know, a lot of folks may know, uh, heard, heard something about the large scale combat operation gap study from about two years ago. 17 gaps uh, that Army senior leaders identified are the most critical issues that we need to solve right now if we're going to be uh, successful against a near-peer threat in large-scale combat. M most of the solutions for those were organizational problems, uh, and the solutions are now in the total Army analysis problem so that we're adding uh, extra capabilities to solve those gaps, whether it be on a staff or, uh, you know, or, or on a, a combat unit because we needed more logistics capabilities to haul fuel or, you know, provide bridge crossing assets. Uh, so that's really the uh, four phases of, the, of an Army Lessons Learned program integrated with, with the Joint Lessons Learned program, uh, and, and it really helps us guide driving change for the Army. I was going to add one thing to that great uh, description, Rich. You know, go back to the Arctic. We've talked about the Arctic study a little bit, dovetailing on the, the LISCO or large-scale uh, gap study. But I wanted to pull one through a little bit just to, to demonstrate kind of a vignette on what this really means. So um, with the Arctic study that we, we, um, we just did re recently, um, and that was a pretty quick one. We found out about that in late December. We had a team on the ground in, in Alaska in the early part of February, so that's a quick, pretty quick turn, uh, gathering lessons on the ground. And, and where I'm going with that is we brought back over 100, um, easily over 100 gaps or potential issues that we, we thought we might need to, to, to dig into, uh, focus on. Is the U.S. Army really prepared to conduct operations in the Arctic or in extreme cold or extreme conditions? And those, of those 100, we now have about 20 that we've we've run through this process that Rich has described generally, uh, 20 or so that have been validated that we think are actually uh, issues or observations that must be uh, validated and fixed essentially and, and, and turned into lessons so that it can be applied you know, back to the Army. One specific, I'll just dig in a little bit even more uh, uh, a little more deeper than that um, is on the medical side of things. So as we start looking at equipment in Arctic, we've got some great kit in the Army right now uh, that has been tested in many different cold weather environments or you know around the world in, in combat operations. But we've we noticed in this specific study that if it's in an Arctic environment, it's still really good. But if it starts getting wet or if, you know, there's, if it's warm for an extended period of time, there become some challenges with the, those, those pieces of equipment that are designed to, to keep soldiers warm. And then further to the, me the medical part of it, we, we got some great feedback from our, our medical center of excellence uh, teammates that a lot of the cold weather injuries that we were experiencing in this, this little in the couple week uh, exercise with USARAC were specifically from medical professionals that were trying to treat soldiers in extreme cold weather. So when you think about it, you got that glove on that's keeping you super warm out in the, in the cold weather. The second you have to pull it off to administer an IV or even, you know, try to, you know, do some sort of medical treatment when those types of, uh, when, our, when our skin's exposed to that kind of temperatures, pretty cold. So that's just, you know, that's a, kind of getting into the, the weeds a little bit. That's just an example of how we take it all the way down from identifying that, that, that or discovering that opportunity to get some lessons from an Arctic exercise up with Alaska, all the way down to how some of the COEs participate, give us a very pointed feedback and observation that, you know, has now been validated. We'll run it through the dot mill PF process like, like uh, Rich alluded to, and, and we'll, we'll see in time, you know, what the solution to that cold weather injury kind of observation I just described is going to be, but it, it could be, it could be solved or uh, through equipment uh, training in a different, different ways. So that's just another, another way of a vignette, if you will, of walking you through how we do that process. Yeah, yeah we, were, we were gonna get to the uh, general officer steering committee towards the end um, and talk about the Army Lessons Learned Forum, but I think it's a perfect time to start talking about it. So I, I found that, that aspect of the Lessons Learned process pretty interesting to learn that 
the Gosk and, and, and the ALF just has so many power players involved. You know, you have representatives from all the major commands, the divisions, the corps. You know, is that uh, mentioned it, sir, Mr. Tottleman, that, you know, that's kind of where we decide a path. But essentially, is that where, you know, we get that lessons learned and we stamp it and say, hey, we need to codify this in doctrine? It, yes and no. Okay. I mean, and, and that's a horrible doctrinal answer, I know, but it's okay for a call. <laughs> no, but it, it, it just it just depends, right? Because there are some, like I just described, the, the Arctic one, and that's, again, a very focused, maybe tactical level observation in terms of the cold weather gear. That may not need to go all the way through to the Goss level to get um, resolution. That that may be solved at, at a lower level, you know, with the COE level, and it may it may, may just be so apparent. I guess would be the way I would would couch that that it it doesn't need to go through Goss. But there are others that um, that, that may need to go through the Goss process. Um, and, and again, as you mentioned, that's the beauty of that quarterly engagement just talking about learning it as general rainey has you know pointed at me a few times and said just like rich said it's not lessons observed it's lessons applied so that's the that's the key point that we can bring to get bring together a not just a higher level senior leader forum but we can bring issues into the forum that need to be addressed uh, that may not be getting addressed otherwise and behind, again I, the it's it's quarterly so it's four times a year but there's also, as, as you all know, there's, there's other meetings le leading into it at the action officer level, at the colonel level. So I, there, I guess where I'm going is there's a lot of filters that get, to, get applied to the, to the issues that, that get brought into the GOSS. And I think that is really the, the, the power of the GOSS is it helps us get a finer point on some of the, um, the issues or observations or lessons that we we may need to take to the three-star uh, or senior leader level to get resolution because we just haven't, for whatever reason, haven't been able, either aren't aware of them or just haven't been able to get them resolved at a, at a lower level than, than bringing them to the quarterly goss. Rich, something else there? Yes, sir. You know, in the lessons learned business, um, you know, every unit out there wants to be known as a learning organization they're they're going to get better and, and a lot of and that that learning organization culture is really set by the commander and and the junior leaders on on how do we get better um and without that command emphasis uh that that a unit is going to have a tough time you know trying to be a learning organization same same mindset with the goss getting senior leaders involved in the lessons learned process at some point is 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 money in the bank um you know and, and granted it's another rock in the rucksack of our senior leaders and things like that but getting better improving performance increasing readiness informing modernization that that that's that's senior leader business yeah. and, and two follow-ups to that is you know right now the, the ALF GOSS, the quarterly forum, I mean, it, it, you know, it ebbs and flows in terms of how many people participate in it, but we, we average over 70 general officers or, or SESs that, that participate in that you know, three-star forum. Um, so that's pretty good participation, and that's not just because calls, you know, doing something specific. That's just because there's a lot of, like Rich just said, there's a lot of units that care about getting better and learning. So that's that's another huge part of that that opportunity. It just it's just a way to flatten the army in some ways and really share lessons, even if we maybe don't have the the fix right there in that gosh. Or we we because sometimes we do identify issues through the discussion, but at least there's there's um, increased situational understanding around the army about a specific topic. So that's a, one part of it. And the other the other point I was going to make is they're they're frequently routinely. Uh, one of the outputs that comes out of the, that GOSS forum is, you know, taskings or or fixes. So when we have a discussion about something that went, you know, went particularly well or didn't go particularly well in a warfighter or in a CTC rotation or a or or an observation that was made in some exercise around the world, and at, you know, part of that discussion will a lot of times lead to that output of, okay, so based off of you know our, our assessment and, and the lead-in and, and the presentation. Here's some taskings or some directives to certain, uh, maybe it's a COE or, or even it's uh, different organizations that, you know, as part of the Army leadership that will be uh, responsible for following up on some of those 
issues or observations so that we can get to that, that fix. That, that might not be possible. Those taskings or those fixes may not be, um, they wouldn't become outputs if we didn't have that forum. So that's another real key part of that, that senior leader forum. Again, paying, paying a little bit of attention, two hours, four times a year on, on, on doing some lessons. You, you mentioned this earlier, I think, in your introduction, sir. So we have the Joint Lessons Learn Information System, the JILIS. Can you guys talk about that a little bit? You know, how is it organized? How do we search? Is there unclass classified? You know, is there a repository for the sensitive issues? Can you talk about that? Sure. Um, about 20 years ago, each of the services had their own lessons learned database and repository. Uh, in the call building here at Fort Leavenworth, we had a room, a uh, raised floor, a bunch of servers sitting in there. Uh, we, we, we had, a, we had a, a platoon of information technology specialists. We stuck them in there with the servers, closed the door, and slid pizzas under there. And they, and they literally <laughs> managed terabytes of information that was in there. And so when somebody in the Army had a question about, hey, what are the lessons associated with um, convoy operations? You know, we, we would guide them through that system. Now, unfortunately, our system didn't talk to the Marine Corps, didn't talk to the Air Force, Navy, uh, and so in about, uh, about 2003 timeframe, when the Joint National Training Capability came out by Department of Defense Directive, uh, the Joint Staff said, hey, uh, why don't we have one system? Why is the Army paying millions of dollars a year to manage terabytes of information? Navy's doing the same thing. Why don't we have one system? We can all talk to each other. So now, through the Joint Lessons Learned Information System, which is the Department of Defense's program of record for lessons learned, we can share it. I, I can see what happened at 29 Palms, what observations came out of the exercise at 29 Palms last week. Um, and uh, it, it is, it's, a, it's a good system. It requires a little bit of uh, manipulation. In our Lessons Learned course that I mentioned earlier, we teach folks how to uh, get in, establish an account, get into the system, uh, set their search criteria, uh, and, and get at the questions, you know, get the observations and, 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 and documents associated with whatever topic that they're ser searching for. Uh, it, it does require some practice, um, but we, CALL, have the Army's administrator. Each one of the services has an administrator. So in CALL, we have one guy uh, that uh, does that for the Army, and so uh, he establishes the accounts, uh, keeps them active if they go stale after a while. There is a sipper Gillis and a nipper Gillis, uh, and so we're starting to use sipper Gillis more now uh, as some of our local local resources for for zipper storage uh, and moving to the cloud is it's kind of creating some, uh, some opportunities of using the resources that are already out there and that that's what the joint lessons learned information system is it's it's a department of defense wide program of record and it's run by the joint staff j7 there in uh, suffolk i think is the uh, is the is the network hub uh, and uh, we, administ we administer it for the Army, administer the, the accounts and do that management for it. We, we participate in uh, JILIS uh, development uh, configuration control boards, if you will, uh, on what, does, what changes need to happen to make it more user-friendly. Um, and and we, we teach uh, how to do that, how, how to manipulate it in our lessons learned course. A couple follow-ups there I thought of, Rich, as you were talking. So I don't know how far back you can search in Jillis. I mean, it's probably when there's, but I just wanted to make that point, for, you know, again, for all joint services, but specifically for me, for the Army. There, you can go back a long way, not just in our own call Army repository of information, just looking on our webpage, but you can dig back into, I mean, for sure, Vietnam lessons learned, or uh, lessons learned, um, but I've been told even further back than that. So that, that is a pretty unique capability to be able to get into. Or you look for recent things. Um, just, you know, again, got my attention as you were talking, uh, looking at world events right now and, and uh, you know, conflict in the Middle East and, and, and uh, yeah, certainly in Israel. Uh, so we, we were kind of looking at that, and, and somebody asked the question, well, did, did we do this before? Or did we Have we written about this before? And, Sure enough, 2014-15, uh, 
pulled out the classified, which is on our shipper side of you know, Gillis and our repository. You can you can look at the the previous kind of conflict that was uh, happening uh, in that same area. So just a couple of examples of how uh, there's some pretty useful information in there that may apply to, to units, but as well as you know, doctrine writers as well. And this is some, if I have a CAT card, I can get an account on this thing? Yes. Okay, good, that's, that's good to know. Now, the, the, the limitation uh, on, on Gillis is that um, we, we haven't, uh, the joint staff has not opened it up to our um, interagency uh, partners there so it's still CAC card enabled uh, but if you're interested in getting an account come to the call website uh, we can get you connected uh, to our Gillis administrator um, set set you up uh, and and get you started in there but but and like I said before it, it requires a little bit of a little bit of practice and uh, learning uh, to use the search engine correctly to get get it what you want but there's there's tons of stuff in there. One other point there that I'd offer. You mentioned the lessons learned course, so we've talked about that a little bit. And Gillis is actually you know, obviously part of that. I wanted to to talk about that lessons learned course. We used to do it in person. You know, this is one of those. Maybe it's a maybe it's actually a benefit of the the COVID year we just experienced. Now we've done it uh, virtually again for the last year or so. And the benefit there is we're getting a lot more. Uh, we're able to allow a lot more participation instead of the six or eight people that could come into our conference room in our building and actually go through that course now we're doing 30 40 50 at a time in that distributed lessons learned course so again just as a an opportunity for you if you're listening in if you're if you want to learn more about learning and, and get into the lessons learned course or become that jealous manager for your organization that that's a great opportunity and, and we have the ability to turn fewer people away now that we're doing it virtually. You know, the force sometimes thinks that, you know, lessons learned or best practices, techniques, and doctrine are all synonymous, right? But they're, but they're not. So what are your thoughts on uh, making that mistake and really what's the reality? Yeah, no, I, I know we've talked about this in previous podcasts, but, you know, not going into the pedantic detail, uh, you know, by definition, doctrine includes fundamental principles, tactics, techniques, and procedures. Uh, call has a slightly different taxonomy. The big difference is is that doctrine uh, has been authenticated by the assistant, uh, administrative assistant, the Secretary of the Army, uh, and basically has become official Army policy uh, and applies to the entire Army. Lessons learned may be a little more focused. Uh, you know, they may, may may only be applicable to you know a particular OE or a particular uh, uh, theater. Yeah, uh, uh, but but there's a slight difference kind of in the two. Uh, I don't know if you want to say anything about that, Rich. I I think it's important to make a distinction, but I don't want to get in the you know kind of the details of the different definitions. Yeah, so, sometimes there's a, a misperception that that a, a call product is a Cliff Notes kind of version of doctrine, and that's that's really really not true. Um, you know, we, we have analysts write uh, their observations and, and maybe some some uh, issue discussion recommendations on, on, on how a unit can do something better. Uh, but again, th that has to be tried by the unit before they can say, yeah, th this works for us. Because it, it may work for somebody in the Europe theater, but not necessarily in Pacific theater. So it, it, it is not doctrine. Um, in, should be viewed as that way. It's, it's uh, you know, and some of the things on the call website, uh, some of the articles and the news from the fronts, for example, uh, news from the combat training centers. We have an observer coach trainer at the National Training Center that has seen 10 rotations of units coming through the box at Irwin uh, and, and has seen time and time again how they've not been able to synchronize fires with maneuvers and, and has seen one unit do it really really well and he writes a, a, a you know a six or seven page article about it and poof you know they, he sends it to call call says this is great stuff and so we put it on the website and, and, and it's out there but it's not doctrine it's uh, uh, it, it's suggestions of ways to do business uh, that might become doctrine once it goes through the formal doctrine development process uh, but but right now there are lessons and best practices to share for other folks to look at ways of tackling problems but every once in a while, um, you know, we 
we do get requirements from centers of excellence to produce products that serve as a bridge to doctrine. Uh, and a, an example is uh, the Army Combat Fitness Test. Now, there were pilot ACFTs going on for about a year. Um, every one of those pilots had lessons and best practices to include on, you know, how do we store all this gear? Well, there was a first sergeant here at Fort Leavenworth that developed uh, the design, designed a, a, a mill van with uh, hanging points and racks and things like that. And, and this thing was the best thing since sliced bread. So we got those designed and we put it in a handbook. And, and then the Center for Initial Military Training gave us a lot of their emerging doctrine that had not been, you know, fully, uh, fully validated by the end of the pilot exercise, but units were screaming for information on the ACFT because it was coming up and it sounded hard. Uh, so we produced uh, two, doc, two, two versions of the Army Combat Fitness Training. Another one, Command Post Computing Environment here in Michigan Command Center of Excellence. Um, a lot of SOPs out there. It was initial fielding to units, uh, not full fielding. Uh, still at initial operational capability, all the manuals associated with it weren't on board, but units were saying, hey, I got it. I got this thing, so how do I, you know, when, when my operator Lee PCS is at the end of this year, how do I train my new guy? Uh, and so poof, call, call produces a, a document that kind of bridges to doctrine. Yeah, well, great points, Rich. One other thing I was going to throw out there, too, because we, we use a word or the term best practice frequently and that's, that's a great term because it can be used for a lot of things mm -hmm. but and where I'm going with that is one really I thought unique example of how call unexpectedly and certainly not uh, we didn't look forward to this opportunity but when COVID became a pandemic and became a you know obviously a, a, an emergency for the U.S. military and across the world going back to earlier in the discussion we talked about our our um, our LNOs around that network around the world, what we were able to do very quickly because we had those connections to units with our uh, LNOs, we were able to gather best practices from different organizations as the pandemic spread around the world. So starting you know, as we watch things in Korea, or I guess in the East, um, as we watch things in Italy and, and move through Europe, we were able to gather those they weren't lessons learned yet. They weren't. They weren't. You know. They weren't necessarily just observation. But they, we were getting best practices from units on how to deal with that threat that was popping up, as you all know, very rapidly. And and we were able to just put them on our web page, created a specific you know uh, page for for COVID response, not to just write handbooks or write things about it, but to in, share information with units or organizations around the world rapidly so that maybe they could identify some of those best practice best practices learned from them or be ready for for the pandemic when it started to uh, come into their area so i thought that was one maybe non non-doctrinal if you will or not an unexpected uh, use of the term best practice <clears throat> but it was uh you know i think something that we were able to to bring to the fight that was uh, beneficial um, a, a couple other things i was going to mention uh, related to some of our, our terms, I mean, getting into the products a little bit, you know, because we do have different terms for products. You know, is it a handbook? Is it a study? Is it a guide? Is it a, a catalog? And, and, and we just, they're just different um, effects that those different products bring to you. Uh, and it just depends on the, on the topic, uh, largely why we put those labels on them. In a lot of ways, what I like to, what I like to tell our own guys at a call is you know, a lot of times doctrine tells us um, a lot of ways the what sometimes what calls doing as rich mentioned as the bridge is it okay you got the what or maybe we don't have the what yet but here's maybe how to do something so that's kind of where that's where the handbooks and guides come into play it's really helping a unit understand how to do something or maybe why to do something uh, versus just the what that's really important uh, but that's I think sometimes more of the, the, the focus that we can bring uh, a couple examples um, that I was going to throw out there too. You know, wet gap crossing is a term that's used uh, constantly. If, if you're doing a, a warfighter at the divisional core level, if you're part of the MCTP training path, you've heard that time million, million or that term million times. Or certainly within large scale combat, that's a term. And, and there's lots of doctrine. There, there's uh, there's lots of lessons. 
there's lots of observations, best practices. So that that is a topic that we looked at and go, well, that might be a great topic to put a handbook together. Maybe as as doctrine writers are updating the doctrine uh, manuals, uh, we can put a handbook handbook on the ground. It's not just what it's not just regurgitation of of uh, doctrine. It's okay. Here's how a couple of other units that have done the same thing have applied that doctrine or applied the theory and, and able to actually execute that that task. That's I think one uh, decent example. Another one. You know, sometimes we deal with things that are concepts or not quite yet in as as Rich said those bridges. You know, not quite in the doctrine. An example uh, example there is the the jagic. You know the, the Joint Air Ground Integration uh, Cell uh, or Center uh, that was certainly a few years ago, three or four years ago maybe, uh, was, was a big topic as as divisions, cores, well specifically divisions, went through war fighters, focused on large scale combat operations, and, and really uh, learned what what's the best way to do that that integration of air and ground in a division AO airspace uh, ownership, all those kind of things. Multi-domain task. Multi-domain, right, different domains. Um, the JAGIC originated as an idea, maybe a concept, moved its way towards a TTP. We, we were able to write about that, again, capturing lessons, what worked, what didn't work, as it was handed into, between the Army and the Air Force, frankly, right, as it moved through the doctrinal process, Army, it became doctrine, but in that space that it wasn't, we were able to maybe help expose that idea to the broader audience. Chuck, uh, yeah, that? I was just going to say, that's, that's, that's almost come full circle because, uh, you know, the Jagic, Jagic uh, was kind of one of the solutions uh, that came out of a uh, airspace control collection analysis team back in, you know, 2006 or 2007. Uh, and and it, the Army had begun to obtain its own airspace control capability. There had been an ASOS or an AS, uh, uh, Air Support Operations Center modernization uh, initiative going on where they'd moved the th these things down to the division level from the core. And the question was, how are you going to integrate these into a division headquarters? Uh, and working with the Air Force and the results of these studies, kind of the JAGIC became like the idea, was the proposal. Uh, and I believe Call had published a handbook, uh, and then we turned around and wrote a doctoral publication on it, uh, a techniques pub. Uh, well, recently, you know, when we wrote that, it was circa, you know, like 2013, 2014, right? We were still looking at kind of uh, stability and coin, and now we're trying to figure out how to make this thing work with the volume of aircraft or volume of airspace users they're going to be present in large-scale combat operations it's a completely different animal and i don't know it may turn out the jagged gives me the answer you, you, you know we'll have to figure that out here uh, eventually but it's been kind of interesting i know that that, that, that call that collection now there's been several collection analysis teams that have had major impact on the army you know just based on the report that they've written the airspace control uh, was one uh, there was a joint fires collection analysis team back in 2008 time frame that, that, that essentially made the argument for bringing back division artilleries and a couple other kind of higher level uh, artillery headquarters. Uh, I argue that the uh, uh, 2015 TRADOC dot mil PF assessment in Ukraine, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that had call and cap participation and was led by AWG. Uh, was the impetus for the new FM30 or the current FM30 that we published in 2017, which can completely change the focus of the Army, right? I mean, completely, almost 180 degrees uh, from what we've been doing. And that was all kind of call, you know, call stuff. Well, again, it, it just it highlights the, the close relationship and importance of having that, that observation to, you know, informing doctrine process that we've been talking about today. The other one I was going to highlight, I think it's another great one uh, to read more about, <laughs> is the reconstitution discussion. That's another one that, similar to JAGIC, was was highlighted f probably in lots of exercises or, or um, experimentation, but specifically in some warfighters division and core level of the last year. That, you know, organizationally, the Army has changed for a lot of good reasons, focused on COIN and, and counterterrorism for many years, but if if we want to reconstitute large organizations that might be required required in in a large scale combat, that we had some work to do, uh, and and we were able to 
Um, I think highlight some of those things in a couple of pub uh, publications. I know for sure those were handed to CAD and, and, and right. in, in current doctrine. I think. Right. No. And, uh, and and I believe the draft of the reconstitution. I I can't yeah. remember if it was just signed it's or it's, it's out. Was published. It's published. So the reconstitution manual is out. Yeah. We it's, uh, call publications kind of do serve as the basis. A lot of handbooks do at least. Uh, just because you can get them put out so quickly. Now, not everything gets used. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for example, you guys put out a pretty good liaison handbook. Yeah, uh, and and I just so happen to have a liaison chapter. I think liaison is a big deal. Uh, you know, based on personal experience as a captain, uh, mm -hmm. so I like to make sure that's kind of straight. And uh, uh, when I have a chapter on it in FM six O, and we essentially have taken your liaison handbook and and updated our material based on that, uh, because I thought you had some better stuff. You had more stuff on interoperability and multinational kind of considerations, uh, which are very uh, kind of very important today. Yeah. Yeah, but before I became the call deputy, um, I, I was the chief of our analysis division, where, where all, all of our analysts are. And, and one of the things that that we emphasize to all, all of our analysts is, is when they're when they're producing one of these handbooks or guides, uh, the last thing that they want to do is violate existing doctrine. Uh, and there's been a couple of cases where the call leadership has said, okay. Hey, have you staffed this with the proponent? Have they, you know, and in some cases it's yes, they've they, they provided this input. They're all over it. Matter of fact, here's, here's, the, here's the email that I got from their chief of doctrine that says this is great stuff. Uh, we're definitely going to use it in the next revision. But a, but a couple times our, our analysts do uh, violate that no-no there in call, and, and they, they write something, and, and when we... When, when it gets caught, it gets changed. Um, you know, it, it, it's not a replacement for doctrine. It's not doctrine. It's a way of applying doctrine, uh, and, uh, and it's, it's a great relationship we have here at Fort Leavenworth, not only at Fort Leavenworth, but also at every one of the centers of excellence who are producing doctrine as well at the brigade and below level. Because that's going to be our first question, when we, and we appreciate that. I mean, as a doctrine guy, I haven't watched this for like 15 years now. Yeah, I think I think there's a much better job at call making sure those things are actually, you know, based in doctrine. You know, that people understand what the doctrine says. Because that's the first question we're going to ask when we get an observation up. Here's a doctrine observation, you know, and and I go, okay, great. Let me go read what the doctrine says. Well, I disagree with this observation, so. Uh, where do you go from there? Because there was, it just needed a little bit of work, but it's greatly improved uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, and so, you know, and again, some of the stuff we just reached out and grabbed. You know, this uh, the, the, the lays on the handbook. This this uh, publication you put out last month on leader development under contact that came out of Fort Horn, I think that is masterful. Okay, that talks about how to develop leaders and very heavily related to mission command, how to train guys to ex exercise mission command. And, and, and I've started to draft that already for the next ADPC. I'm not even going to ask anybody. It's just, it's just going to get you. It's not perfect, okay? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't match my words exactly, but the big ideas are there. And in some instances, it says what I was trying to say better than, than what I could have. So I'm just going to take that, and I'm going to steal it, right, which we do with a lot of stuff. So. As long as we cite it, we're in good, we're yeah. in good shape. <laughs> no, Chuck, that brings up another great point that I probably touched on earlier, but it's worth repeating or highlighting. That you know that product specifically, I think, came from the NTC. But it, it, I just wanted to make the comment that we get a lot of input from the CT, all the CTCs. I mentioned our permanent presence there; that's really important. But it's also it's another way to get feedback from the, the COGS, you know, the, the commanders of the ops groups out at all the CTCs. They all have outreach programs. So in a, in a lot of ways, we are another way to amplify what the CTC COGS are seeing, what the CTC groups are seeing. Uh, and that's important for units, and it's great to hear that's helpful for, you know, doctrine as well. Yeah, very much. I mean, call started in 1985 because of the Combat Training Center program. And the reason why calls, the Army put established the Center for Army Lessons Learned is because too many lessons and best practices, and in some cases data, was left out in the box. 
um, it wasn't captured, it wasn't disseminated to the rest of the force, it wasn't put through the analysis grinder uh, to validate, you know, those issues and, and observations. I mean, if, if you think about, you know, 10, 10 rotations a year at NTC and JRTC and, 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 and at least one at JMRC and, and all the other multinational things that they do, uh, th th there's a lot of learning going on in each one of those rotations. So how do we export that learning to the rest of the Army? Uh, and that literally was why Call was formed. We, I love the, the, the topic of the handbooks and all the other products. So if I'm out there listening and I want to go look at, the, look at these, where do I go, sir? So there's two ways, um, well, at least two ways, but uh, um, that I would recommend to you that's the, the quickest path. So unclassified, if, if there's a, a public release document, because we do have some documents that have to be only on the, you know, the, the CAC-enabled uh, website, but, but if it's public release, and that's our goal, man, it's always our, our goal is to write for release so we can get it out to as many uh, uh, soldiers, joint teammates, uh, partners, multinational partners around the world. So we're always trying to write for release. But if, if, if so it's public release, it's on our, our uh, call website. Um, and, and typically you'll see that, you know, highlighted on some of our products. Uh, but that's one way on, on our unclassified website. The other one would be on our, our um, unclassified still, but uh, CAC-enabled website. That, that's where we have the preponderance of our, of our um, information because by definition, a lot of times when we're talking about gaps or lessons, that sometimes leads us into the, the what we used to call FOUO or, or now controlled unclassified information realm. Uh, that, that's that's a, a great repository that we run in terms of a website that leads you into Gillis as all those other things we talked about right there. So that, those are probably the two gateways uh, that are easiest to find right now. Uh, we, we are trying to stay as digitally enable and agile as we possibly can. So. Um, a couple things you'll probably see on the horizon here soon. We are we are looking into um, apps. Uh, we, we have had used an app before, and the challenge sometimes becomes that that CAC enabled process. But we're we're fighting our way through that. I think we got some good solutions. Our, our new public, uh, we're going to rebrand our public web page. I just told you about um, information we don't need to talk about here because I don't understand half of it. But it it's just going to make it a little bit more available and that will be have a little bit more of a feel of a, of a app uh, like function to it so that'll be beneficial and then uh, I think the other thing I would mention um, or two last things I'd mention if you're at a CTC or you're out in an organization and you want that that handbook or you want that printed document that hard copy um, send us a note and we'll send it to you we'll mail it to your unit uh, we'll, we'll send you individual copies or there will be stacks of books at the CTC all of our all of our analysts I talked about forward, they maintain a library at every CTC, so that's another way to get it. Um, and then lastly, I was just going to mention the, um, the idea, the concept, the new idea that's coming online, which is Army 21, how we fight. Um, it, you know, it started about a year ago. It was something we, we, we uh, inherited. It was an idea that was sent to us from a couple of senior leaders with some great vision. And it really started just as an, an idea to me, put a video together about how, to, how is the Army organized, where are we located, uh, so that junior leaders, company level, battalion level leaders could, could learn more about the Army. It's turned into more of an interactive multimedia learning tool. We, we built it at the brigade level, so right now it's only focused at the brigade combat team level. Uh, we're, we're doing some upgrades to the website, so it's not online right now. It should be here back within the next couple of weeks back online. But look for it here in the next few weeks, as I said, or, or certainly by the uh, beginning of the new fiscal year, we're going to unveil the next version, which is going to talk at the division and core level. So we'll be able to show you and give you a platform to come into digitally, virtually, that you can learn all about the Army, uh, where the Army's located, how they're organized, how they're equipped, and there'll also be connections in there to doctrine, connections in there to lessons learned, connections in there to... Um, uh, operations and, and operational environment. So that that's another interactive way that you know. Stay tuned. Keep keep plugged in the call, and, and that might be something you can benefit from in the coming months. Again, we're going to roll that out uh, in October at the AUSA conference. Is uh, the next release for the division and core version. Rich, anything else there? To 
Uh, no, sir. Right? As we're moving to the cloud uh, here in TRADOC, um, our, our, our actual URL address may change, but right now it's pretty simple, you know, call.arm.mil. Um, that will get you to our public access site, uh, and there's a tab on there for uh, access to our restricted site, which is CAC enabled. Uh, and anybody with a CAC card can get on it and, and take a look at those uh, other documents that um, have, have gaps that have documents with gaps on it or, or aggregated things that require additional, uh, additional control in terms of the release of that information. Uh, but we'll, we'll find out here in a couple weeks or so what, what our new site might be and we'll try to get that out as, as best we can. The, the other thing I, I missed, and, and, and I'm glad I remember this one, but you can just subscribe. You know, so just like us, maybe that's not the right word, but there is a way, to, again, on our website, click on the button that says subscribe, and, and we will, that just opens up the door. You'll get newsletters, you'll get a monthly push from us, a quarterly newsletter. We'll send, um, you know, what, what's the latest information coming out of call. We'll send latest products, linkages to CTCs, linkages to other, you know, to CAD, other to other organizations within uh, CAC. But that's another great way if you're looking, if you're hungry for more, hungry for more lessons learned, we can uh, we can reach out to you and push that information to you as well. Well, gentlemen, as we wrap up, I just, just want to ask: Is there anything else that, that you wanted to add before we before we call it a day? Okay, no, thing. Now, I have one thing I want to go back just real quickly to sure, some sure. of the handbooks, um, and I wanted to mention MDO MDTF real quickly. Mm -hmm. Not to get into the discussion of doctrinal definition of multi-domain operations as much as Chuck, I know you'd like to do that, but but I wanted to highlight again just a, a new, a slight nuance there. Uh, we've produced uh, a catalog on multi-domain operations um, and MDTF relatively recently. I would highlight to that if you're looking for information on MDT or on MDO, we've got I don't know three or four or five years of information on MDO. And then, specific, again, as it's evolved, right, from a concept now moving into doctrine, but that those, some of that historical information is in there. But specifically, I would uh, recommend to you, if you're interested in reading more about MDTF specifically, um, we, we just published within about a month or two the Multi-Domain Task Force 1 Quick Look, and it's, it uh, very graciously was um, enabled by General Eisenhower and his team in MDTF 1. It's a lot of great specific lessons that come out of that one as well if, if you're interested in reading more about the mdo mdtf yeah. well gentlemen on that note i think we'll wrap things up today so thank you for joining me i'd also like to thank our listeners and note that the views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the official position of the united states army the u.s army training and doctrine command or the combined arms center i'm captain wyatt harper and this is breaking doctrine <laughs>